you close down the biggest movie in Hollywood history. I'm not shooting another foot of film until I have a scenario I can believe in. You went into production without a screenplay. I thought I had a screenplay. I'll give you $10,000. You're not shooting Wizard of Oz anymore. I've got two weeks to go. No, you're through with it. I'm being fired? For what? Because I slapped Jimmy Garland that time? Five days to turn this into a screenplay? You know what a banana is? Yes, Mr. Selznick. The fruit? Yes, Mr. Selznick. You know what peanuts are? Yes, Mr. Selznick. You know what I mean when I say this door stays closed. Then Fleming and me acts out the book for you. Acts out the book? You have a better idea? The whole book? We do a scene from the book. He watches it. He writes it up as a movie scene. By the end of the week, we have a movie. Hello everyone, welcome to the podcast. This week we have got Paul Glazer that's come on, which is super, super exciting. Um, he is the Managing Director of the English Theatre of Hamburg. He has a career that lasts over, you know, 35 years and you've been involved in, in so many amazing parts of the industry. I mean, the list is, is incredibly impressive. You know, a singer, a dancer, a writer, a songwriter a director, a producer, um, you write music. I mean, it's it, it's unbelievable, a choreographer. Um, so, and also a, I should say a teacher as well. I mean, there's just, there's, there's so many strings to your bow. It's very impressive, Paul. <laughs> Before we get into all of that, um, which I'm really, really interested in doing, um, how are you? How's things? And it's been a very long time since I since I last saw you. Yeah, I'm good. I'm well, as good as can be expected. It depends on what level. You know, professionally, <laughs> it's it's very difficult. And yeah. in my position now as being the managing director of a theater, obviously, I'm trying to keep the spirit up and 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 motivate people. And we've done a couple of really uh, you know good initiatives as good as we can make them I remember right at the beginning of the pandemic I turned around to every I mean yeah, it's a smaller team you know we, you've been to the theater but still and I said okay from now on we're not a theater anymore we're a tv station and so we tried to go back and find productions from the past that we could stream and we started that really really early um, dealing with with rights from publishers, which was completely new to them. When I call up from a play that we had done in the past, and I'm telling the publishers that we would like to have not the filming rights for it, but we would like to stream our production, which we normally record for our own purposes. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as you know, you come over, you hear a uh, guesting from, from uh, the UK and doing a performance, which is, yeah, over, period of like three months yeah and if something were to happen to an actor if there was an injury or something that we had to exchange an actor then it's always very good to have some sort of tape of the show that we could send to a new actor for them to prepare so we had a fair amount of video material yeah and the publishers reacted very differently some of them were like you're not supposed to have a copy or and as time went on weeks and months, then the whole tone changed and they were so used to getting requests for streaming rights for the show. And we were able to do that quite well, I think. We had several shows and pretty successful, of course, um, you can't compare it to having an open house, but at least to be present with 
people. So we were, we became a little bit of a TV studio. We turned the stage around. We, we got some camera equipment and, and that, that was fun. And it now, now, now it's getting a little tired. It's a, it's a little bit harder to, to get that buzz as well, isn't it? From, you know, when you don't have an audience there that's receiving the, the, the word, obviously there is an audience watching, but sorry to actually Extremely see difficult. it and feel, feel that energy from them is it's a completely different. Um, yeah. yeah. Like, like, you know, I mean, I thought it was, um, uh, for example, right at the, when the pandemic happened, we were in the middle of, of doing Apologia, which is a beautiful play um, uh, with, the, with the five, is it five, five characters. Uh, if I, that's ridiculous. That, yeah, f- like five <laughs> characters. And we had played that half of the run yeah. uh, for very, very good houses. And, um, and then right in the middle of there, we had to cut it and we, we went into a lockdown and uh, so I asked the actors and everybody, and I got the rights to be able to do this, a stream, and then we got a camera team in, and from one day to the next, we, we played the show, because uh, of course, wanting to have a, as high quality as possible, the performance, filming it with like five cameras and mm. sound and everything. Um, and that, that's when you could tell that suddenly, from performing in front of a full audience, to performing in front of an empty house with just five cameras. It was like pulling the rug underneath the feet of the actors. It became, I was like, what's happening? It's a little yeah. stiffer. It's not like they're communicating. You could really tell the difference in, because they were so used to having that kind of emotional response from the audience. And for an actor, as you know, it's like Helen, the actress who just played Shirley Valentine said, it's like, you know, uh, in, in a play of five characters, the audience is then the sixth character, or it's always, it plays such a big part. So it's mm-hmm. difficult to try to find a way to do that without an audience and still mm-hmm. have the same kind of buzz. It's yeah. more a case of putting your house in order because you care about it, as opposed to putting it in order because that big bad landlord up above is watching your every move. Is that what it was? Tamako, who? Imperatrix, Christina. Yeah, sweetie, what's opposite me? Oh, sure, honey. Regina Travivalist, green, with her dominion. Tamako Mahara. She's a new Japanese designer. I've never heard of her. Overseeing the lands of a subject with a steely eye of disapproval and despair. But then I don't really know that much about designers. I don't read Vogue or anything. No. I'm wondering where it all went horribly. Wrong. But I have heard of Gucci and stuff. We're using these spoons, so that we are. But I don't generally know that much about oh, fashion. That's one of the things I love about you. <laughs> but I do know a beautiful dress when I see one. That's very kind, Trudy. Thank you. I imagine it must be harder now you're not working. Will it? The money for a start. I see. Till you feel better. Until you feel ready again. Money. Until you feel you're strong enough. Strong enough? To find another job, I mean. I see. We could do this in Swedish. You're in Sweden now. I, I'm in Sweden, yeah, but I, I fear that my Swedish is not, not quite as good as yours. So, um, <laughs> I, and let's just say, <laughs> let's say I am fluent in Swedish, but for the sake of the, uh, the international audience, we'll do it in English. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, <laughs> I'm not fluent in Swedish, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, anyway. Uh, I, <laughs> I can hear some Let's, let's do, I'm just going to, can, we can prata a little Svenska, eller hur? We can prata a little Svenska, men, <laughs> men bara <a> lite. <laughs> but yeah, going back briefly to what you mentioned about recording for, uh, you know, if someone drops out or someone gets injured or there's an issue, like it, it immediately brought back a memory that I had when we were doing um, Stone Cold Murder and you know, one of the actors, he, he hurt his voice immensely and uh, he had to go and get it, get it seen to and looked at. And then we had to fly in another actor and um, we were sort of mid, mid run at this point, I believe. And um, this is a long time ago now, uh, quite about eight years back. Um, and yeah, we had to, he had to look at the video and then we were sort of like guiding him through the process, but it was all sort of during performance time. So it, it was, it was a little bit of a roller coaster, a roller coaster ride, but we, we, we got it back on track, but um, it was very helpful to have those, 
those recordings for for such occasions. Um, I believe that's when we met was on Stone, Stone Cold Murder. You were, you were so. doing, yeah, you were doing a lot of the choreography for all of the movement based work that we were doing on that, and uh, there was a small dance piece that we had to do and. Um, with myself and Madeline, and uh, that was that was a fun and games. I enjoyed that. I made him pay for it, though. You? How? Who are you? Did he send you? What? Listen, I need you to calm. But I've been rough. He sent you. Olivia, calm down. He sent you. I know it. Has. Matty, hello. No one is going to be out in the mountains at this time of night and in this weather. They'd have to be a madman. I could murder a drink. Any whiskey? So you are from where in, in Sweden? I'm from, uh, first, just a little bit on what you just said about yeah, changing sure. and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. those kind of things are also extremely interesting for an audience, for an audience to come into a theater, because that's what makes it so different from streams or whatever, even though streams might be live, is to come into an audience and see li a live before anything can happen. So it's yeah. always that risk element and as you know every show is different yeah. so if an audience finds out that oh we have exchanged an actor we will do the best we can uh they're extremely forgiving most of the time and even if an actor goes on with a script but it's always adds to that mm -hmm. and i think that that it, that's what makes theater so wonderful that that you can uh that they are accepting of that and and they're part of something very very special that is one thing about the uh, the the audience at the English Theatre of Hamburg is it's one of the best audiences that I've ever performed for. I think they are generally the people that come there are just are just lovely, and um, you know they are as you say they are forgiving of, of of things like that. They're supportive. You know you get excellent feedback after shows, and um, I remember when we were going through it, and the actor that came in, he did actually have the script in hand for for a two or three of the, the, the following shows. Um, but he learned the lines incredibly quickly. He literally came in and, he, and I was amazed at how quickly he learned the lines. Um, but they were sort of the first show. I remember we were all a bit like, how is this gonna, how is this gonna play out? Um, but they, you know, they were totally behind it. And I, I, I remember I had this like warm feeling of like, I felt very supported and within that environment. And that's one thing I but remember I think, very I think fondly. It's Interesting too, what you're saying, being being a co-actor in that situation, it sort of <clears throat> it makes you have to think differently as well. How do you respond to yeah. somebody who might not? How do you help somebody or bring if they lose their script? If for, because we don't have somebody uh, as a fleurs, you say in Sweden, somebody sitting in front of you, gets feeding your lines or somebody screaming your lines from the wings. But I think the pressure on all the other actors too, for, because you tend to after a while sort of get into the momentum of a show and you're so used to things happening and some people get some actors tend to be very thrown by another actor doing something else or going a little further with something and other people find that vital to yeah. be able to keep the performance alive not that you change anything but it could be the intent it can be little things that sort of yeah. keeps it alive but that, I mean, yeah, absolutely yeah i really i really believe that like it, it it's um I remember at the time we were we were obviously very nervous about it and apprehensive, uh, but but it was it was really exciting and we found lots of new things that we didn't have before and it was just like a different energy and you know he he did things in a slightly different way not necessarily better but it was just it was just different and um, and it, as you say it brought the whole the whole show uh, it took it to another level actually I remember that it was yeah. a very bizarre feeling because I didn't expect it to happen in that way but um... no because what I, what I do find interesting there is like the work until the premiere and and actors are 
in their characters and we're improvising or we're doing things and, and it's finding how would my character react in a situation like this or why do I have that response? Mm. Um, and then once the show is up and running and playing and you sort of come into the, you know, the, the momentum of things and uh, not thinking about that so much, having an element of insecurity like that will force the other actors to sort of be whatever, how would my character react to not having the line in a certain way? And it sort of brings you back to that initial state of forming in the show and feeling very secure in what your your character would do in mm. certain situations. I, I find it very interesting. Maybe I should yeah. put that into practice and just do that every yeah. now and then, just changing the actors whether they want to or not. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a reality TV show to me. Um, <laughs> I, I'd be know, it, it brings me to think about, for example, like I've done lots of long running shows, like, you know, yeah. um, Yes, we in the English theater we do we do seven shows a week normally. So it's Tuesday through Sunday, and two double shows in between. Here in Germany, when I first came to Germany, I was doing big musicals. I was I'm saying big because um, in Sweden we also have musicals now, um, but uh, uh, they they're never running as long. I mean, if you look at Jutta Boy, uh, for example, you wouldn't have a huge show like you would and you wouldn't even have that in England in England you have big shows but they're in smaller houses because you don't have the houses um when I first came to Germany I came down to do Cats mm. and that was right at the beginning of it that was back in 88 uh when that when musicals in Germany didn't exist um and they were building houses for cats was the, the biggest thing here and then after that they brought starlight in mm -hmm. and starlight in london is uh, also in a, in a it's, it's, i was going to say smaller house so it sounds really stupid but in comparison yes what they were doing here was they brought starlight in and built like an arena for the show so suddenly you went from like a thousand people 800 to a thousand people in the audience to 2000 people and they tended to do that after that that they brought over different shows and uh, and just built these mega theaters for it because of course you have a lot of people in germany you have so many more people in germany than you have in sweden for example mm -hmm. and cats um that i came down i was the second generation in that show it had already run for a year um became the the first commercial musical in Germany and now Hamburg is considered to be the third musical city in the world is it actually, really? after London and New York then Hamburg because Hamburg in uh, on generally has like four to five big musicals running parallel uh and it, when I came down of course it wasn't like that so it was a big it was really a big chance from Fritz Kortz, uh, the producer in that time. He got the theater down on the Reeperbahn for like a euro from the city and then to be able to test the show. And they rebuilt uh, or started to rebuild the theater. And everybody said, this is never going to work, commercial theater, because they're used to, you know, this uh, three, I don't know what you call that in English, the three-part house you have. Uh, the opera ensemble and you have the, the actor ensemble and you have the dance 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 ensemble yeah. so it will be ballet it will be opera and straight theater right okay. and musical was considered to be something just absolutely silly and stupid and it would never sit well with with a, a educated audience but it did so well uh that it played for like 14 years here i only, i did it for a year and a half with eight shows a week um and uh and all the other shows, like phantom did as well and starlight did as well and then other shows started to come and then musical theater became kind of in germany what today it's just uh, unbelievable uh, yeah. and i remember coming down to do the show i came i had never seen the show because it was very new I had heard memories on the radio, you know what I mean? That was a, a vague kind of thing. Mm, I know I've heard that song, it's a good song, you know, but for me at the time, I was in a classical company in Sweden as a classical dancer, uh, where I also had a very unusual contract with that theater because I was not only a classical dancer, I was also a singer. 
And in, in those theaters, uh, you have you have a season for everything. So we had done our ballet season uh, where I had danced in, in all the different ballets we were doing. And then I went into to the season with the operettas and stuff, which was the big thing back before musicals. So I was singing uh, uh, the young lead in like Oh My Papa and different shows like that. Mm. And, uh, and I was writing music the whole time, parallel, which I've always done. So when I came to CCAST the first time, uh, I, was, I, was, I was not impressed by the choreography. I thought it was, I was wondering what the hell is this? <laughs> and I was not very impressed by the music. It was a, a, a very fun show to do. Mm. But the fun thing was that when we're doing the show, eight shows a week uh, forever, that... Um, moment of surprise needs to kind of be there to keep the show alive and they started to play games on stage like for example passing the coin or something like that so we would do the show and somebody would poke you in the back at some weird moment and kind of pass you a coin and you had to hold on to it first and then find somebody else just to and I hated that I thought it was just so unprofessional and and just awful um, and I couldn't believe people were doing that while we were performing Mm. Then realizing that now in retrospect, seeing, okay, that was a way to bring that risk element into the show to keep everyone on their toes. And mm. so you are awake and you are still, and you don't get into this just repeating, repeating. And, and so the show is getting more and more tired. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a long story to get to that point. No, I, I've been involved in a few, uh, a few shows where we've done something. It's kind of similar, but uh, some actors, not all, but some do like to introduce little little games that you have to sort of get in within the show at some point you know um yeah. put something in a cupboard that that ordinarily wouldn't go there just to uh just to make you sort of think oh that's a bit different and and bring a sort of a, a freshness to it um so the your performances when you, uh, for the musicals of the cats and things like that was that done um in english or in in german no german, german. okay cool, to cool. answer your question uh way back oops, yeah Sala where i'm from Oops. so you're 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 fluent in swedish german and in english uh, yeah those three languages okay. that's what so for those those that are um myself included those that are trying to um master a, a new language um do you have any tips or advice on on that because i know everyone has their own little quirks and ways of doing it but it'll be i'm always intrigued by those that can speak more than one language or amazed should i say um and you speak three so that's that's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, what what tips and tricks do you have for for that? Well, somebody once told me, or I read it once, that once you've learned a second language, the third and the fourth and the f whatever it is becomes easier and easier because I, I guess it's something in your brain where once you've learned to communicate in a different language, that's the hardest step, the first. And and you guys, uh, English speaking people. I think have a harder time because everybody in the world speaks English or, or a lot of people do. And so you could get by with English pretty much anywhere. Uh, you can't with Swedish. So once you, you go abroad, you, you, you know, you, you, you find yourself in situations where you have to express yourself in a different language. And that is the key, the key. Uh, and I guess, of course, everybody is different. Some people learn, languages very well by studying them theoretically and 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 then finally i do remember in school though i was never not much of a theoretical student i remember when we had fr french or uh english in school that usually uh, a handful of girls always got the best grade uh in every test but they just could not speak freely it was it was so weird they they would they could theor, um, theorize the language and, and write it perfectly and uh and i couldn't i would have lots of mistakes but when it came to free speaking i had no problem because i'm not afraid of making mistake or making a fool out of myself so i, I would say something and most of the time the, the person uh would would understand that I'm speaking to would understand what I'm saying, and uh, uh, and that was for me the trick. When I came to Germany, I didn't speak German German at all, and we had to learn. Well, at that point, doing cats, it was 
learning a script in a completely foreign language and sing in a different language. And then also in the city, uh, living your everyday life, having to speak German to a degree. Of course, in the ensemble, we were a very international ensemble, then you could speak English. But as soon as you left the theater, it was German. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think for me personally, that is the key to be in a situation where you are forced to express yourself in a different language. Mm -hmm. And um, it's headaches in the beginning and it takes a long <laughs> time and you're gonna make a hundred million mistakes. Yeah. But that's after a while, uh, even in English, you know, I'm start to, you start to hear why, how things sound and, and like, like I'm, I don't know about you, um, but if I would ask you why you would say a certain thing a certain way in English and ask you to grammatically explain it to me, is that something you would say, oh, it's because of this and that, that's why you say it like that, or is it not just really? Plain? No, I mean, I, I suppose, you, yeah, you just learn it from, from early, don't you? If it's your native language from the early years and then it, it sticks with you, but you get influenced over time by by other people and you know different languages and cultures if you live in different countries things you watch on tv i mean i find now that being in sweden i i'm the i'm the only english source like i watch english tv but um uh you know i and i speak to my kids in english but outside of that i'm just hearing swedish like all the time and i i find you know like sometimes i'm trying to say a sentence in english and i'm like what am i talking about like how do i what is the word for this? And I'm starting to forget words in English, which is very, very surreal. So I suppose immersing yourself in, in a particular country and living there and being prepared to make lots of mistakes and, you know, just, uh, and I'm trying that with Swedish, you know, I do try and speak in Swedish where I can, um, you know, in the shops and ordering things and with my kids, teachers and, and things like that. And, um, it does help for sure. Um, the challenge with being in Sweden is that a lot of Swedes really love speaking in English. And uh, as soon yeah. as they hear me, they hear me speaking Swedish with an English accent, they, uh, they immediately want to, to jump into English. And I'm often like, no, I'm, I'm trying here. I'm trying unless I'm completely stuck and floundering, in which case I ask them to save me. But, uh, but generally I try and say, you know, I really am trying to practice my Swedish. Please don't speak to me in English right now. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it. All right, good. So um, you trained at the Royal Ballet, uh, the Royal Swedish Ballet School, uh, mm -hmm. which is which is actually where my wife trained. She used to be a dancer as well. Really? She, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was there, um, and she danced uh, contemporary dance mainly for. And she, I mean, she did ballet when she was training there and bits of ballet after that, but she sort of moved into contemporary and did that for quite a long time. Um, mm. She really enjoyed that experience. How, how was that for you, uh, training there? Did you, did you have a good time? Was it enjoyable? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, I, I started when we, did, when we moved down from Uppsala to Ekrö, which is a small community in Småland. I started to dance there because I was very interested in, in, uh, in dancing and uh, I was always singing, I was writing music, that, all, everything at once the whole time. And then I went up to Stockholm and I auditioned for Ballet Academy first, which is um, a very, it's also a, a big dance school in Sweden. And, uh, but they're more focused on modern, the modern dancing. And in those days it was also called jazz, modern dancing and jazz, different things. Yeah. And uh, so I got into that school and I did that for about a year. And then in the midst of that, I auditioned for the Royal Ballet School where people normally start when you're <clears throat> like three months old. <laughs> it's like, what? really? You, wow. you start very young. So, yeah. so with like six, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I think that what they did was that at the time they wanted to sort of raise the quota on modern dancers and realize the importance of having more of that in also the Royal Ballet School. And in came this little guy who was just so different from everybody else. I, it was very cool and that, you know, and ballet wasn't my in comparison to, to everybody else, it wasn't my strongest thing at the time. And, uh, and then I, I 
was accepted into that school and I decided to change so I broke my education at the Ballet Academy and I went over to the Royal Ballet School and absolutely loved it. For some, something about that discipline, something about the structure uh, really grabbed me. And so quickly I evolved in that school, being in a group where uh, when they start the classes in a ballet school, there were like 30 boys or something like that. And by the time I joined them, they were about 15, for something like that. Okay. And then every okay. half a year, you basically audition again, which is, it's a world that is so, so elite. It's like a, like a elite sport, mm -hmm. if you will. And so you are forced to be not, even if you are friends with your, with your classmates, you're still always in competition. So that every half a year, you have basically an audition for the teachers and everybody. And then either they say that you've developed correctly or you get a warning or you're kicked out. Mm -hmm. And so that is a reality for kids in that age. You have to imagine that you're never safe. So I, for some reason, took to that mentality and, and started to train and developed within those couple of years that I was there. So I actually graduated then as a classical dancer uh, from the Royals, which I had never actually planned when I was down in Småland. And it was not like, oh, uh, well, I set that goal and I kind of wanted to do it, but it was not like my only goal or it just more or less happened that I got drawn into that. And I really, really enjoyed it. It was a wonderful, wonderful education on so many levels. All right. And were there, were there um, <clears throat> elements to it that you took away from the school and, and were like uh, life lessons, if you will, that they, they, they sort of trained into you and anything that stuck with you over the years? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, I think that's the key for most things. It's, um, you, you, there's so, uh, in basically anything, there are so many surrounding experiences that you get, be it social experiences or whatever that you, that you take with you and that most people don't think about. But the whole world of, of ballet taught me so much, which of course, um, just, you know, fast forwarding a hundred years when I'm standing in front of you and I'm teaching like fight choreography, for example, which was one of the things that the English theater before I was um, working there full time, um, they used to call me up and go, we have a play um, here. A good example is, um, uh, Othello, for example, where there's lots of sword fighting and dagger fighting and stuff. And, and the director, I wasn't directing that, who came over from England, uh, was asking and said, well, I need a sword fighting coach for my actors. And then I had done so, so many fights choreography, if you will, and stuff like that for the English theater. So they asked me, can you do, can you teach sword fighting? And I was like, Absolutely. I've never sword fighted in my life. <laughs> but uh, I had just seen actually a show in South Germany where they did a production of, of uh, Zorro, which is a new musical mm. with uh, music by the Gypsy Kings, I think they're called, um, and watched a rehearsal with them when they had sword fighting there. And I remember that rehearsal so well because the sword fighter was teaching them a certain technique and he was, and somebody else was saying, well, couldn't we just do it like this? And he said, no, 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 that's the French school. We're doing the Spanish school of sword fighting. And I was just sitting there thinking, who gives a flying dot, dot, dot? <laughs> As an audience member, I wanted to look real. I wanted to look, I don't care if that's a typical Spanish move or in those in those days, that was French. So this is a British, you know, so for me, when I got that question, I told uh, the theater to tell the director that um, I, I can't, if he wants a specific school of sword fighting, I'm not your man. But if he wants it to look real and for the audience to accept it, then yes. Mm -hmm. And then all of that comes into play. Movement, dancing, safety. As a dancer, you always have a sense of where you are in your body. So I started to work with the actors and go, uh, and on top of that, one of the actresses who's supposed to win this one particular sword fight was in her early 60s, 
and, and she had hurt her right arm oh and she's right-handed so her arm had to be in like a, a sling or whatever you call oh, yeah, it yeah sling is the like same sling sling yeah. and and she had to fight with her left and and she had to look like she in this character she was playing actually won over a guy who was in his he might have been 25 the actor pretty tall and very physically capable so how do i make that look yeah. real actually and then it's just about finding a pattern of movement and she mm. trips him and she could to you know and that becomes the key then to mm. any kind of fight situation and that is nothing that i had to go and study myself it's just something if you are a dancer and if you have i could teach or bring out of them how it to me would look real you know what I mean? Yeah, and, doing, yeah, yeah. and also, of course, having safety absolutely as your the biggest thing. This would be dangerous to do this. But I had no uh, problem accepting that challenge because I re could rely so much on my experience as a performer and as a dancer and choreographer that I knew that I would figure it out. And what I do also think with choreography is that... Um, and I'm not saying that all every dancer is a choreographer or every singer is a songwriter. It's just as what you discover about yourself as you move through life um, was the fact that just letting myself go into a room with two actors and solving a problem in the most convincible way. It's not about me sitting at home figuring out a choreography that I think is good and then teaching that to an actor that's never... Gonna, that would work on dancers. I could come into a room and I could show them a choreography and teach them and they would dance that. Mm. But if I come into a room with actors who are doing something physical, it's all about what can they bring to the table? What mm. do they make look real? Mm. Or what feels good for them to do and safe? So it's, it's really a communication. So I worked with them, see if you stab him like this or if you would block it like that. And then really you know, choreograph it, if you will, on those actors, and then it looks real. And then they can represent that, they can do that convincingly, and they feel comfortable doing it, rather than me coming in and going, this and this is the way you have to do it, now go and practice. And then yeah, it's always yeah, yeah. gonna look like, oh, it was almost there today, but think about your yeah. elbow, or, you know what I mean? That's very interesting. I, um, I was doing a show and uh, we had, uh, there was a fight sequence in that and um, two of the performers were very comfortable with, with stage fighting. Me being one of them, I was quite comfortable with it. And then it was another guy. And then um, one of the other actors was not so comfortable, but we were encouraged to, to do this particular routine that two of us were okay with, but one was really struggling with. And rather than actually bringing the three together and saying like, what can we as, as a, as a group come up with that everyone's going to be comfortable with and be able to do effectively and, and, and realistically. Um, this, this actor was not forced, well, kind of forced, but had to, had to try and do these moves and, and it got progressively better as the show went on, but it was, some of the time not that convincing and um one of us nearly got hurt in the process because it wasn't done at the right time and this that and the other so yeah that's 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 something that i if i'm ever in that situation again i will i will recommend that for sure or su suggest that as a to me to me personally i mean unless you're speaking about uh say a musical with dance with choreography is there you have to be able to do that choreography yeah but when it comes to that situation that you're specifically talking about, then I, uh, I was going to say I think it's more the the, the choreographer's fault, if you mm -hmm. if you will, not mm -hmm. to lower the bar to the point that you know, oh if they can't do it, we'll just do something super easy. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's about. But the job for a choreographer or it, how I see it for myself as a director is to bring the piece to life and to do it with the actors that you have. And it's your job to make them look good, feel safe, and for the situation to work. Um, because there's nothing worse than if you're an audience member and you paid good money to see a show and people are struggling to, um, to sort of perform what they did, unless, you know what I mean, either 
you keep the audition process going and you find somebody to do that choreography perfectly mm -hmm. or you choreograph on the material that you have in this case the actors i mean it's the same when i go see musicals i'm writing music um uh, to to uh, transpose music is not a problem a musician can sit and play most of the time and if i told that musician to take it down a third uh, well it depends but most of the time with a little time to figure it out they could play the third lower for example or they could so when i sit and i hear a musical um where the key is not really fitting the singer like if you take um well, I'm not going to say an example right now, but if you can just imagine you're sitting there, you're seeing somebody who's perfect for the part. They're singing, they're, they're uh, looking the part, doing everything correct, but it's just slightly too high for them. So they really struggle. That's not comfortable. And that's not what makes a song or makes the listener <clears throat> or takes the listener to that emotional point, which the song obviously is trying to do by having an explosion and a high note that works a third lower just as well because it sits in that person's voice so when they explode on a g or an a or whatever it is for a male singer you have goosebumps and you think it's wonderful but if you bring it up to a b b flat or b and you go oh, it's a little high then <laughs> yeah. i'm never <laughs> yeah so then i'm thinking if i'm would be i've never been the musical what well, i have to but but if i would be in that position um, then I would say, let's take it down for this actor. Do you know what I mean? At that point. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, right? But, it's, but... A note or, it's not going to change anything, no. but it's going to make him or her comfortable and it's going to bring the show to the point or that point of the show to where we need it to be without forcing them to mm. screech up into the high heavens. Also, make it, the, also, the making, um, also making the audience comfortable as well, right? Do you have a, a preference uh, of, of a particular art form? Singing, songwriting, <clears throat> directing, acting, dancing, um, you know. No, I don't. I don't. Because for no. me, it's they're um, so similar, if you will. It's, it's, it comes down to, to storytelling. It comes down to expressing an emotion, been able to, to be pretty uh, successful in the different fields. And it's yeah. been basically now at this point, I see it's been... Um, leading up to this point when I, I'm a director now and, and a writer and uh, I don't really choreograph that much, but um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's more of utilizing these different um, disciplines as colors on, you know, on canvas, if you will. So I don't prefer either of them. For myself personally, I, I quit my performing career that was like 10 or 10 years ago now. And I decided that I had done, I'd played, you know, most of the parts that I wanted to play. And it was just not really alluring anymore. It was having done it for 30 years. Um, and there was so many other things that interested me. I said, no, you know what? I will focus on, on. so I stepped away. Um, and it, I've never regretted that a second. I know a lot of people who, who would go, oh yeah, but I still miss being on stage and stuff. And I haven't missed it once. And it's, it's no indicator as to whether or not that was important to me, or it just means it's an involvement is to utilize that knowledge to something else. And now I get to be a puppeteer, if you will, I can sort of work with those things and I can teach what I know and I can work with actors and not be, you know, be limited to just acting. I can do the same in, in choreography and in music and in singing and I can help people. And, and that's a wonderful feeling, being a creative person to sort of go, I've written a story, the character does this and this, and to be able to see that come alive and have an actor and, and work with the actor to bring those things out and find that you can actually help this actor on all the different levels um, is, is an amazing feeling. Like bringing the example back to this one show I mentioned earlier without saying the name, I'm watching rehearsals and I'm seeing this, it's a musical, I'm seeing the director uh, where they had picked a theater director to direct this musical. And I have utmost respect for the genre musical as much as I have for, for straight theater or anything else. I don't sort of evaluate them and say musical is just silly. And as long as you, you know, which is, 
the frame of mind of this one particular director watching this rehearsal is what I could read out of it, that he said he had the actors um, and then he had a, an ensemble of, of singers, the choir, he had an orchestra and he had the dancers. And all he worked with the whole time was the actors, that he wanted them, their intensity in this scene and everybody else was on a break forever. And I'm kind of thinking, this is what musical, this you use to be able to emphasize that moment in the show. You have the actors, yes, but working on their intensity alone is not going to do it because it's a huge stage. So you have to adapt to the format of the stage. And that's what you use the ensemble for, the dancers. You want them to lift the whole thing and you want the music to work with that to create the moment that he was trying to do with just the actors because he didn't have that knowledge, I would assume. Because then what happened was that the actors were acting the scene and then he had the singers come in from the right and sing with the choir and they left. And then the dancers come in from the other side, had a formation, danced a little dance and left. And I was like, that's not how I would use it. I mean, and, and you're not even touching on the potential of using these different elements to create what it is you're trying to do with these two actors in front on that mega stage. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, so no, it's, we, it's interesting because I mean, I, I I had a similar experience, but but sort of on the on the flip side of that, where the where the actors were permanently on a break and uh, the the dancers were 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 the um the, the the main focus, the center of the show. I mean, they were fabulous dancers, but uh, it was an ensemble piece where they had cast actors, they'd cast dancers, they'd cast um, acrobats, and you know all sorts of different people and um, um, parkour guys. I mean, it was the potential was was extraordinary um and, and i feel like it got sort of halfway to 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 where it could have got to because you know that it wasn't rehearsed as an ensemble it was it was very much the focus was on one section and and the others were were left to sort of work it out really for themselves which i thought was very bizarre um and uh but yeah yeah it's, it's, it's... No, i think that is that is really what i love about the situation that i'm in now is that I can, to the best of my ability, um, create pictures and, and uh, experiences where I can use all those different elements because I've been there, I've done that. I mean, um, for example, there was this, um, how, do, how you work with dancers, what they need, how you work with singers, what they need, um, uh, as far as scheduling, for example, like you have, um, you can't come in at 10 in the morning and do a full on run of something with dancers, unless they have had a class before and are warm and they're only warm for a certain period of time. So if you can sort of say, now you warmed up and it's 10 o'clock. So let's meet back here at 1130 and do it. They're gonna be sitting and trying to keep, you know, and just, and the same with singers and for actors, it's different. What does an actor need at that time? Um, and just that alone to then utilizing the art forms in creating, in creating a picture. And that's, uh, most people don't think about it. The scoring, for example, for a movie that you would ask them after they saw a film and you would say, well, how did you like the music? And they go, music? I wasn't aware. And, and that, that's where yeah. score really plays about you watching it and just those subtle things happening sound and music yeah. and everything which just builds the scene it all adds to it doesn't it so Absolutely. important so what you're saying about a situation being an actor trying to figure it out for yourself just uh, shows to me that the, the, there were potential in the show that they probably didn't know how to utilize yeah. you know i think it point. came down to a last minute uh meeting where the actors basically pulled the director slash choreographer to one side and said what are we doing like we mm -hmm. we we've come up with a way of doing it but is this in keeping with with what you want for this show is it does it work with what everyone else because we also we were very segregated so we it wasn't until the very last sort of day before the show where we actually got to see properly what everyone else was was bringing to the table so it, it was just a bizarre i mean i i enjoyed elements of, of the experience um and it was a big spectacle and it looked great. Like, uh, oh, it looked very good, but I just feel like the content could have been, you know, so much better. But anyway. Um, no, I think you're so right in that because it, that's a whole different aspect about 
how does the individual performer on stage perceive their own performance in relation to everything else? Mm. Some, some and, and that's what you also have to do as, as a director, choreographer, musical director. You have to also, in that case, motivate the actor as far as making them understand what their contribution to this scene. It might be just stand here on the side and be quiet. And you just stare at the distance, but it needs to make sense for the actor because then the picture painted is, is what we're looking for. And, uh, and because there's nothing more annoying than not knowing what you're doing on stage and just having to do something randomly and not understanding how that fits with everything else. So obviously you need to be able to share that picture with the actors or the dancers or f for them to see, oh, that's what we're doing this. And we're trying to create this. And you're at this point symbolizing this. And then I think with that communication, most of the time you don't have actors or people on stage dangling me there, not knowing what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had one of those as well. And you've very recently written a song, uh, Voice of an Angel, which I wanted to talk to you about very briefly. You try to rise above the rubble And make sense of it all You leave it all behind you Without knowing what's in store But when it all falls apart Rising out of the dark Is the voice of a To give you strength to move on When the night feels too long She'll be guiding your way Before the break of each new morning Before the rising of the sun You're caught in the shadows and you got nowhere to run But when it all falls apart Rising out of the dark Is the voice of an angel To give you strength What was the uh, the inspiration behind uh, behind that song? <laughs> I'm laughing because um, that it's very interesting when people ask why did you write this or uh, how did you uh, come up with that thing. It's usually in my world, it's never what you think it is. Right. Of course, I will I will tell you that the initial inspiration to that song was. When somebody, when you're having a hard time, such as everybody under this pandemic or most people, it annoys me a little bit that there are companies and businesses who are doing very, very well and others who are, so it's a little bit unfair. 
but uh, that struggle to find that inner energy to um, find that second gear, if you will, that springs to life. That's what the song is about. It's okay. going at some point you will, um, well, those classic things like, you know, the darkest hours, the hour before the dark, you know, it's even if it's cliche and if it's, I, I do believe that it's something to it. And I do believe that people need to feel hope and to feel that that's all we have when we're just left uh, in the midst of, of something like this where nobody knows. So of course that is the initial, that, that is the core of the song, but that's nothing that I have, um, it's, well, it's basically going into describing a creative, pro or my creative process now, that is um, subconscious. It's, a, it's an image that I have when I write a song, but I don't focus on that. Then whatever comes to me at that point, the focus are on other things. Um, and in the end, so most of the time when I've written something like a song, it can surprise me afterwards. Like I go, oh, okay. Mama? Mama, bist du da? War das gerade der Donnerknall, vor dem du mich warntest? Mama? Mama, sag doch was. Eben noch warst du in meiner Nähe. Eben noch war alles ganz normal. Jetzt höre ich von Weitem nur die Krähe. Ihr Ruf erscheint bei Stille so brutal. Ich weiß nicht, was ich fühlen soll. Mein Herz, das wird mir schwer. Mein Körper ist mit Angst so voll, sonst fühle ich gar nichts mehr. Du hast gesagt, es kann passieren. Doch warum traf es dich, Mama? Ich fange an zu frieren. Wieso traf es nicht mich? Der Lauf der Dinge, sagtest du, gilt auch für dich und mich. Ach, Mama, hab ne gute Ruhe, ich warte hier auf dich. Und morgen weht der gleiche Wind in unseren Bäumen. Trüg mich viel zu weit davon Und morgen werde ich dann von dir träumen Ich warte auf dich, denn ich bin doch dein Sohn Wir können uns niemals zu weit entfernen Wir sind uns viel zu nah, dass das geschieht Einstweilen singe ich noch zu den Sternen Doch irgendwann Hört auf der Tag mein Lied. Denn morgen, morgen hört auch der neue Tag mein Lied. Mama? When I first came to Germany, um, then I was always like I also did in Sweden. I was working in, in studios on the side. Mm. I was doing other shows on the side. I was the only, I was very much the kind of the black sheep in the ballet school because I was also performing in like a fashion show where I was doing cool things, which nobody knew of. So you would have like a show late at night in Stockholm where some of my new friends from when I just sort of started in the ballet world, uh got to come and they were outside the stage so i said you can come tonight and you can watch the show and they're like oh my god and then right before the show basically i would go to somebody in the venue where we were and i would say there are a couple of you know my friends outside can you let them in and outside was this like row of ballet students you know standing in for position the girls <laughs> with their hair like and they got to come in and stand in the back and i was doing some sort of whatever fashion disco show that that we did it's uh, how, how those worlds were. So it always happened parallel to me, you know, all of those things. And songwriting when I came down to Germany was I had my first record deal and, uh, and I was writing music for myself to sing. And it became so utterly serious that I questioned myself every step of the way. I wrote a lot of songs in those days also but they became very um, contrived. 
it was like I'm, I was writing, if I wanted to write something to say, for example, I love you in a song, I would be that stupid, that's just too simple. So instead it would be a metaphor that I thought was very clever and somebody would listen to it and go, oh my God, that's really... And instead I was, I was distancing myself from the listener more and more and more. So what you heard in the end was a very, very hopefully clever song, but had no emotional response because it was so far away from the initial thing I wanted to write. It was not until I wrote my first musical, which is the, called Peggy, it's a country and Western musical, um, which happened uh, just because I was working in Berlin doing a show called Shakespeare Rock and Roll with a completely British ensemble and director and costume designer and crew. Everybody was British. And I assumed accepting that contract that after a year, I would speak more like this the whole time. I would be like, I thought my accent will definitely change. Yeah. This is not my first language. So I would be there and after, and it, it kind of didn't. Yeah. It, I started talk more like it was I became more and more American, if you will, during that time where they made fun of me for doing it. So for fun, I went home and I wrote in the studio, which I always had my studio in my house uh, for at least a four eight track recorder, keyboard, microphones. And I was always writing music at night and stuff. Um, and uh, so I went home and I wrote a couple of country songs just for fun, just to be able to bring them into rehearsal the next day. And everybody would have a laugh and it would be, we had a good time. Um, so I did. And then people kept asking me about these country songs all the time. They said, God, somebody told me you wrote this really funny song and I would play it. Everybody would laugh. And then that sort of stuck with me. And I, then the next show I was doing was Greece um, in, in Dusseldorf and then also in Berlin. And on the shows off there, the few ones that I had, because sometimes you would have a show off, which means that you sit there, somebody else is playing your part, and and you're just there for emergencies. If somebody heard the, you know, so you can't leave the theater. And um, then I started to write this musical because then I thought, what can I do with these songs? And I put this musical together. And it went really quickly. It was so fast to write and new songs came the whole time. And I wrote those songs on trains and whatever, wherever I was traveling. Or suddenly there was a new song from a character. I would write it. And all of this happened basically yeah, almost automatically because it was a fun thing. It was nothing serious about it. It was a joke. And, uh, and I had the best time writing it. And what it taught me afterwards when I was sitting, when I premiered the show in Hamburg, um, there was a particular one song, a ballad, where the lead character says, exposed, she, they're being, you know, she's not in a good place. And she sings this one ballad that I had taken much too far in the lyrics. I took it, it was a, a joking lyric, if you will. So I, I assumed the reaction would be people would be kind of hopefully drawn in. And then at a certain point, they would start laughing because it was like with country music, it can be so over the top. Swedish people, as you know, anyway, have a very special relationship to country music. We listen to it. We love it. We think it's great. We love Dolly Parton. But <laughs> nobody really takes it seriously. It's not like in America, if you have a song that people would start crying and go, oh, this is an amazing song. We have a certain um, glimpse in the eye, pinch of salt relationship. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that was the same way when I wrote the musical. Um, it was literally for fun. And in the audience at the premiere, I'm sitting and the song starts. And after a while, people are sobbing next to me. And by the end of the song, there were tears and people came up and they couldn't believe and this one particular, they said, how, what were you, how could you write this song? And I couldn't tell them that it was like, it, it was on the fucking train between Cologne and Dusseldorf. And I laughed, I was laughing as I wrote the song because that's not important. The important thing was that I kind of won over my inner doubts that which I had had when I was writing songs for myself with a record contract it was all about being serious. At this point, my creativity was completely free. And I can tell you now that if I listen to the music from that, 
first show that I wrote, there's so much more of me honest in there just because it was under the cloak of being comedy and fun. I dared to just let go. I dared to write, I love you. When I wanted to write that, I didn't have to make it a metaphor. I dared to just be blunt, straight and honest in the music. And that went straight into the listener. And that became a huge lesson to me yeah. in anything I write today. With creativity, with writing, with producing, we stand in our way a lot mm -hmm. of the times. There's so many, so many obstacles we go through mentally as far as, oh, you can't do this, you're not good enough, or, and then we're trying to lean on learning how to write, and we're looking at, and when in reality, it's just about uh, having the guts, if you will, or learning to just let go of that and be, and be true to yourself. Nobody's going to see it until you let somebody see it. So let yourself you know, fly without blinds or, or questioning yourself the whole time. Let yourself do that spontaneous thing, even if it turns out to be the most stupidest thing you've ever written. But in the end, you're going to start learning to be, to be direct and to be honest and true. And that is really for whatever, whatever you do, what's going to ring with an audience, um, be it a song or a play or something else. But having something cleverly figured out is never going to, is never going to have that impact on any kind of audience or listener that you might have. I love that. I actually, I think we can use that for your final thoughts. That was absolutely perfect. I was, <laughs> I was just, I was just what I was looking for. And you just came out with it without me even asking. Amazing. Um, would you rather, are you ready? I am ready. Awesome. Number one, would you rather have everything you draw become real, but be permanently terrible at drawing or be able to fly, but only as fast as you can walk? Um, fly any day. I've always been fascinated by flying. That would be, even if it's yeah. slow. Me too, it, it, Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I wish I was a bird. I always say I wish I was a bird. <laughs> um, number two, it's a little bit gruesome. Uh, would you rather vomit uncontrollably for one minute every time you hear the happy birthday song, or get a headache that lasts for the rest of the day every time you see a bird? Um, vomit. I would definitely, because I could control that, I guess. I could <laughs> have, you know, shoot people if they sang the song, but I absolutely love birds. I was yeah. just looking that way because I have a little bird feeder on my balcony. Okay. So vomit. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, number three. Would you rather be a famous director or a famous actor? Uh, famous director. Uh, number four. Would you rather be able to teleport anywhere or be able to read minds? Um, I would uh, teleport. I think that would be amazing. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, last but not least, number five, would you rather be famous but ridiculed or be just a normal person? Um, I think that's uh, two answers. Okay. And okay. one answer is professionally, definitely famous but ridiculed because it shows that you have had some sort of impact on what you do. Um, privately, I'm not so interested in, in the, the, the fame part so much. And then I have no problem being a normal person. Very so um, it's two answers, unfortunately. It's two answers. It's two answers. That's okay. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you off. I'll let you off. Um, very good. Paul, thank you so much for today. It's been very enjoyable. Well, I hope, thank I hope, you. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. <laughs> Take care now. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Oh
Cause the time has come and everything you ever dreamed 